Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our fireside chat on the Orange Bonds, a new asset class for investing in gender equality. My name is George Stopchinski, and I'll be the moderator for today. So we'll just run straight in um, to the agenda for today. So first, we'll have some introductions from our panelists from the steering committee, and then later on, they'll go through the Orange Bond Initiative overview, giving you some more details about the initiative in general, and then we'll open to a panelist discussion and a Q&A session at the end. If you use the Q&A function on the event on the app, that allows you to put your questions on there, and I'll, I'll take them from there later on. And so now I'll move to the panelists for today and introduce our speakers. So from IAX, we have Ms. Natasha Garcha, the Senior Director of the Innovative Finance Team. Ms. Garcha leads the IAX's work in their award-winning Women's Livelihood Bond series, but also is a representative on the steering committee of the Orange Bond Initiative. Ms. Garcha has been at IAX for a number of years, spearheading their work in these areas, but also she was the co-head of Corporate Social Responsibility at DE Shaw previously. So Ms. Garcha, I'll pass that over to you. Uh, to introduce IX and yourself. Sure, thank you very much, George, and thank you to everyone who joined this session. We're living in a world in which women are disproportionately impacted by a number of crises. Climate change, COVID, we were twice as likely to drop out of the workforce, and in all the wars that we're seeing everywhere from, from Syria and Palestine to the Ukraine, women are rarely the main uh, combatants, but they're usually the main victims. Yet we still firmly believe that women can be solutions to many of these issues. Having women back in the workforce can add $13 trillion back to GDP. Having women have a seat at peace tables allows peace agreements a 35% increased chance of lasting for at least 15 years. And the climate crisis cannot be solved without half of humanity being a part of the solution. And so for those reasons, IAX, which is a women-led firm, has been working for many years in the impact investing space to bridge the wall streets of the world to the, with the back streets of the world, has had a very clear mission to have gender and women, women as a part of the equation in financial solutions. Um, we're very excited to be here launching the Orange Bond Initiative. IX has issued many gender bonds in the past, but having a very clear asset class of what a gender bond even means, we hope is a pathway to unlock billions of dollars towards this new asset class. We're also very excited that everyone on the steering committee is a practitioner. All of us, and you hear from my wonderful colleagues who are also on the steering committee from the DFC and Naveen, have actually worked on transactions before. So we're not just looking to set standards. We're people who've worked to mobilize capital. We understand the complexities, and we're looking to bring that knowledge into this asset class. Thank you very much for joining us today, and I'll hand it back to George. Thank you, Ms. Gacha. And so now I'll pass it over to uh, Mr. Stephen Libertal, who is Managing Director and Head of ESG and Impact at the Global Fixed Income Team at Naveen. So Mr. Libertal is also the Lead Portfolio Manager for the Fixed Income Team within their strategies to incorporate ESG. Ms. Libertal is also a member of the Investment Committee and holds a CFA qualification and has also sat on the advisory board for the ICMAS Green Bond Principles. So, Mr. Libertal, I'll pass it over to you to introduce yourself to. Thank you. Um, thank you again for having me, and I appreciate the opportunity to discuss this uh, really uh, important and emerging topic for us. One of the things that we have found um, as, as we continue to grow our assets and, and grow our business is that our investors are really looking for a use of proceeds concept that can be applied in a variety of different ways. That there is a desire for ever more granularity in the impact that we deliver to them. And so the, this opportunity, and, and I've been fortunate enough to have worked with IAX on, on three of the four Women's Livelihood Bond um, series uh, deals that have come to market so far. And what we have found has been tremendous reception from our investors. The, the, for a couple of different reasons. One, you know, we, we talk a lot in, in the market now about being able to deliver impact. And what that means is obviously different for everyone, but what everyone is looking for is some type of way to align their principles with their investment holdings. And the concept of a gender equity bond has been really interesting and, and very exciting to many of our investors. And what we're hopefully able to do in, in trying to establish this particular initiative is do the same thing that we did for the green bond, for, for green bonds through the green bond principles. And what we want is to be able to engage with issuers 
to get them comfortable with what needs to be done from a perspective of what an investor is looking for and have them feel comfortable that what they're going to do is going to be, is going to be accepted in the market and going to be considered as cutting edge and relevant for whatever outcome they're attempting to, to provide an investment vehicle for. So hopefully what we do with these principles and, and this initiative is create an ecosystem and an environment that allows for issuers to come to market and investors to be able to find particular securities that really fit what their investors are looking for. Thank you very much, Mr. Liberto. And now I will pass it over to Mr. Richard Greenberg, who's Managing Director at the United States International Development Finance Corporation. He leads the efforts in DFC's contribution to the expansion of social enterprises and the group he leads has closed over $1 billion US dollars in financing enterprises and funds across a variety of sectors. So, Mr. Greenberg, I'll pass it over to you to introduce thank, yourself. Thank you, you George. Um, uh, it's great to be here and I want to thank IAX for organizing this panel. They've been uh, an incredible partner for us uh, as a, and a leader in enabling us to contribute to this space. Uh, so there's some history there and some tra transactions that we've, we've already done. Um, I just want to make sure everybody who's in the room who may not be familiar, the DFC is, used to be OPIC, O-P-I-C, and we are the U.S. Development Finance Institution. We provide financing, um, debt, now we have equity authority, we can provide technical assistance now under our new uh, formulation as DFC, which is very exciting. And we've, we've always, um, I think for many years, we've actually been trying to contribute to uh, gender lens investing, and we have some people who have really been standout leaders in that space. Uh, one of my colleagues, Eleanor Kempelman, actually is on the steering committee of, of this group. She couldn't be here today, so I'm kind of uh, standing in to, to a certain extent for her. Also, I just want to introduce, I have a two colleagues here, Laura Anderson, if you want to just raise your hand, Laura, and Jason Whitney, um, two, two of the colleagues in my team are also here and available to speak to any, any of you. Um, I, I guess the only other thing I would add here is that um, I manage a team, it's called the uh, Social Enterprise Finance Team. and what we're trying to do is um, represent the part of the portfolio at DFC, which looks for more innovative transactions, earlier stage uses of our capital that may not be traditional or conventional in terms of risk, return, and impact. And we've set some sort of higher bar standards for ourselves in, in um, looking at transactions with respect to impact that, that the agency is, is very aligned with, with the agency's mission. That could be small direct deals or um, small funds, and, and also initiatives like this where we have provided either guarantee or funding um, to enable, uh, to catalyze more capital, because at the end of the day, that's really what we're all about, bringing in Nuveen and its, and its clients to this space. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greenberg, and thank you all for being here today and for representing your organizations on the steering committee of the initiative. So now I'll pass it over to Ms. Gotcha, who will tell you a little bit more about the initiative in general and its mission and objectives. Thanks. The orange bond, um, firstly, why orange? We get the, asked this question a lot. So the United Nations has 17 sustainable development goals, as, as everyone here likely knows. The fifth goal is orange in color, and it stands for gender equality, therefore the inspiration for the orange bond. In fact, on the steering committee, besides the DFC, Naveen, all who've been, perfect, thank you, all who've been at the forefront of actually working on transactions. I think this is one of the unique things about the steering committee is that we understand the complexities of this because it's easy to set standards, but you need to have both the gender expertise and the expertise on the financial side to set something that can actually mobilize capital at scale for this very important asset class. The mission is to mobilize at least $10 billion by 2030 through the orange bond transactions. And we think that's achievable, and you'll hear from Stephen, the sustainable debt market already crossed the $1 trillion mark. Um, and so we, we think gender can be a cross-cutting part of that. We also define gender to be very inclusive. We are looking at women, girls, the LGBTQ plus community, because intersectionality is absolutely critical when you think about the different ways an individual can face gender-based discrimination. So besides having a set of principles, we will also be pushing our transaction support and working to develop the ecosystem, which you'll hear more from, from Richard on later in the presentation. Besides uh, the three of us, as I was saying, you, there's a number of other organizations on this steering committee. We have uh, made an intentional uh, uh, 
pledge to have uh, folks from across different sectors and different regions. We have uh, two donor agencies, so besides the and, and DFI, so besides the DFC, we have the Australian DFAT, we have the United Nations Capital Development Fund, we have Water.org, an excellent nonprofit doing fantastic work in, work in the space. ANZ Bank and Sherman and Sterling. So very different from a lot of other groups who've developed other sorts of standards. This is much more inclusive, we hope. This also has made an intentional commitment to have um, diversity inclusion, having women as a part of the conversation, having people from the global south as a part of the conversation. And as you'll hear from me later in the, uh, in the uh, session, when we developed the principles, about 150 organizations from all six continents were invited to, to give input into them. And so with that, we're very excited to now hear from all of you at the end of this conversation. We'd love to take questions at the end. If you have questions along the way, please fill them out in the Q&A app, but we will have 10 minutes at the end for Q&A as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Gotcha, and for telling us a little bit more about how the initiative works. Now I'll pass it over to Mr. Stephen Libertor, who will go over why the initiative is happening and, and, and what gaps it is filling. Sure, and so one of the things that I mentioned earlier was the, were the green bond principles, and I was on the initial executive committee of those, so I, so I helped to write them. And, and one of the keys is, and what you'll see in this chart over my shoulder, is the, the purpose of that entire process was to see, to generate the outcome you see on this particular slide. It was, and, and remains, one of, the one of the challenges in the concept of impact investing remains the issue around subjectivity. What's considered green is different for everyone. What's considered social is different for everyone. And so when you have that much, you know, uh, such a diverse view of what could potentially work, you need to have parameters or processes that are put in place or a framework put in place to have everyone feel comfortable with what it is you're looking at if you're labeling something or naming something. So I, I manage $20 billion, and I know that 100% of my investors are not happy with 100% of the holdings. But the key is, is that they understand why we own something. We're able to explain it. We have a process. We're able to show them directly and measurably why we own a particular security. And what that does for the investor is it provides them comfort in how their capital is being deployed. And one of the things in, in my mind of why ESG and impact investing has been so so rapidly growing over the past few years, and it's not really talked a lot on, uh, about enough in my view, is that using ESG or impact as criteria for how you're investing is really right now the easiest way for an investor to control how their dollars, yen, euros, whatever it is, are, are utilized. They understand where the money is going. And that, that provides a, a great comfort to them because they're not only seeing, first and foremost, financial return, but secondarily, they're seeing the outcome of how their capital is being deployed, and that's really critical. But in order to get there, you have to have issuers who are willing to, to generate securities that provide that type of directed and measurable outcome. And so without frameworks in place, Issuers are extremely concerned and, and very cautious around ever trying to do anything that could label them as, the, the current terminology, a greenwasher. And so what is needed is an ecosystem, a framework, a process that's been put in place where an issuer can look and say, okay, here's the framework I'm aligning myself to. Here are the ex expectations of me. I can say I'm in alignment with this framework. And I think that provides them comfort that they're not going to get called out at some future date of, well, what you did really wasn't in alignment with what we were thinking it should be because there is so much subjectivity. You can at least point to this independent framework that allows for a, a market to develop that you see on the slide has gotten to a place where we have over a trillion dollars of issuance and labeled green social and sustainability bonds and now have two and a half to three, three trillion of outstanding labeled paper. So what hopefully we're gonna to try to do here is, is expand that into the gender area. One area that we continually hear investors very interested in, in, increasingly interested in, is the social bond space. And it's always been historically, while you'll, why you see the breakout you see on this chart is because historically, green investing or environmental investing has been easier to accomplish. And that's primarily because the metrics associated with measuring the environmental benefit 
are fairly well accepted and known, and it's a fairly finite area. It's certainly expanding now with the concept of blue economy investing and, and biodiversity, wildlife conservation, but for the most part up until now, green investing is related to primarily renewable energy. So it's been very straightforward. Social has always been a harder space to define and to identify because there is such a wide variety of potential outcome associated with it. Historically, the easiest one, of course, is affordable housing. But now what we're seeing are other types of opportunities led by, unfortunately, the only positive that's come out of COVID has been a, a boom in the social bond market where issuers were responding to providing relief efforts associated with the impacts of COVID. But now we're starting to see, obviously, moving past that at this point, but also now looking for other opportunities within the social space to identify investment. And the gender space is one that is continually discussed and talked about, yet the two people sitting to my right on the stage are the only two that have ever issued a true gender lens type of security in the public fixed income market. So what we're hoping to do here is take the learnings that we've had from the Women's Livelihood Bond Series and from the DFC's 2X Women's Initiative program and spread that out to other issuers to get us to a place where we can start seeing a much wider variety of opportunity specifically targeted to women because of, as, as Natasha so aptly pointed out, all of the factors that currently point to an underserved population that is critical to the heart of not only families, but the environment as well. Thank you, Mr. Libertov, for telling us a little bit more about how we can see this asset class grow. And now I will pass it back to you to go over a little bit about how everyone can get involved and how organizations themselves can also get involved. So one of the things that we, what we're trying to do is get as many organizations and entities involved from, from across the entire ecosystem um, of the finance world, um, because ultimately what we're trying to do is bring in capital to address these, these particular underfunding and undercapitalized opportunities. So what we've attempted to do is create this orange bond pledge, which allows for people to talk about and be willing to look at and, and for us, really, from the finance side, asset managers be willing to evaluate, potentially invest in transactions, be involved in the discussions on the creation of these securities and the structuring of these transactions. But it goes across that to a wider array of organizations that are issuers. And, and what we're seeing is when we have conversations with issuers, they're starting to recognize that, you know, it used to be a few years ago, everyone had a green framework. Then they had a social framework. Now everybody's coming through with sustainability frameworks. And to me, that's a, the perfect evolution of the market because issuers are, are recognizing that their operations have both environmental and societal impact. So hopefully what we do is by getting this Orange Bond pledge and the Orange Bonds initiative moving forward, we get more people involved and more people comfortable talking about this in a way that actually leads to you know, actual real market transactions that are investable. Thank you very much, Mr. Libertor, for giving us a bit more information on how everyone can get involved. The pledge is online, and it's a digital pledge that we encourage individuals and organizations to sign to become part of the initiative. Now, I'll pass it over to Mr. Greenberg to give a bit more uh, context on the initiative, transitioning from just talking about gender lens investing to actually putting that into action. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I, we've seen a dramatic uptick in interest. I think all, many of you would be familiar in gender lens investing. Uh, going back many years, DFC, what was OPIC, recognized the importance of uh, our, gen our mission to invest in women and have transactions which support women. I've been involved with microfinance going back about 15 years, and it was just understood that m most microfinance borrowers were, were, were women, and there was strong positive impact as a result. And, and, but then, of course, it, it uh, I think, uh, became more understood and recognized that across all of our portfolio, really, there could be impacts on women that needed to be better understood and, and also cultivated and, and encouraged. So we, we, I think, were one of the early uh, DFIs to really try to understand that better and then put in place uh, people to, to uh, advocate for that and also uh, train our transaction teams. Um, and we've done a tremendous amount of tra internal training to, to have a dialogue with any client that comes in, um, whether they have a, a women-focused uh, impact mission or, or not, to try to uh, help uh, uh, 
us understand that and help us provide financing that will that will re realize that in the in the best possible way. So we that that could be smaller direct enterprises that we lend to and also a lot of funds that are building in a gender lens. So we're we're both you know we like to think of ourselves as leaders and 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 tag along with people like IIX and also followers and where the market's going like like uh, Stephen is talking about and and just provide value added where where we can. Um, but I think you know for picking up on what's in the slide here, while there's all this interest, there there hasn't been uh, a maturation of that to to what Natasha and, and Stephen are talking about to to have uh, a broader market that 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 can uh, invest in this. And so $2 billion, it says on the side, capital in 2021 to uh, uh, gender lens investing, lots of events, lots of discussions, but only a very, very small number of gender bonds actually issued um, and without the sort of standards around that that can create that, that market that we all want to see. So the role that we're trying to play is, is to just wherever we can, what partnering with IAX and, and, and Nubin to create uh, uh, again, catalyze other capital. Uh, hopefully when DFI participates, that sends a signal. We're willing to provide, in, a, in some cases, subordinated capital to then help bring in the, the senior debt. So whatever um, it, it appears the market needs for, uh, for, uh, for us to, to take that additional risk, that's what, we're, that's what we're looking to do at this point. Sure, thank you very much, Mr. Greenberg. And now I'll pass it back over to you as well to go a bit over the approach the initiative is gonna to take to actually putting this into action. Sure, so again, picking up on, on what Stephen said, uh, fundamental to development of any market of this sort is, is the standard setting. So that means you know putting principles in place, uh, taxonomies, uh, the language is always very important, aligning with other industry standards. We don't need to reinvent the wheel on, on everything, but build off of it. Um, and, and just host gatherings and discussions. And again, credit to Natasha and her team for, for bringing the parties together and a very diversified group also to ensure that those principles represent and reflect uh, really what the market needs. Um, and the second piece, of course, is the actual transaction work. And that's what you know, our, our bread and butter is, is actually doing deals. <laughs> and uh, that's what gets us ex most excited. Um, we're seeing a, a tremendous amount of deal flow uh, in this space. Um, again, one of the things I think we all need to continue to be mindful of is the sort of, uh, I don't know what you call it, orange washing or <laughs> gender washing, right? Because, you know, I, 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 it occurred to me uh, maybe last year sometime that every other transaction that was coming to us had a big gender label on it. And that's great on the one hand, um, and I think in most cases, of course, it was very intentional, sincere, but maybe not really well thought out or, or an attempt to, to capture our interest when it wasn't really uh, very well developed. Um, also, you know, the, the role of, of providing advice to orange bond issuers and just having that flow of information from people that are experienced who, who have done this type of thing. And, and then, of course, the training component. Stephen, you, you, you were alluding to that as well, especially the lawyers, right? So, <laughs> uh, and then lastly, it's just more broadly the whole market building exercise. And we've seen this in other kinds of sectors, of course, where um, there's a nascent interest in certain sectors, but not really a broad understanding about the e ecosystem. We see that now. I don't know. One of the ones that comes to mind is the EV market, and mobility. I've been involved with the clean cooking space for a long time, even going back some years, microfinance. So, you know, there's a there's a, a set of things that that um, need to occur, right, to to build the, the so-called ecosystem, both the players and the concepts, and and uh, things like certification services. Um, can be very, very important to validate and provide a signal to the market that this qualifies under that 2x gender, less, gender lens investing label. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Greenberg, for giving some more information about how the initiative will actually be put into practice. And now I'll pass it over to Ms. Garcher to go over the, a bit about the principles that will actually make up uh, in these transactions. So over to you, Ms. Garcher. So the principles, uh, we decided to have a three-pronged approach to this. So the first principle is what's most traditionally been done in the gender lens investing space, which says you have to have gender positive capital allocation. The proceeds of these bonds have to go towards projects that benefit women. 
historically, we've seen a number of projects in which it's very checkbox, and I'm sure all of you know what I'm talking about. They'll put one woman on the board, and therefore it's, there's a gender lens. This goes much beyond that. We give people multiple options through principle one to make it more customized for what's relevant for their region or their sector. It could be having a majority woman-owned organization or a woman-led organization, and that is very relevant for some sectors and some countries. But if you look at, say, emerging markets, it has to expand beyond that. So principle one also gives you the option to invest in companies where the products and services disproportionately and significantly impact anyone who faces gender-based discrimination. Similarly, it allows you to look at gender equal workforces, gender equal supply chains, being gender inclusive and equitable in the policies through, you, through which you govern these, these different stakeholder groups who face these forms of gender-based discrimination. And note again, we're not just saying women. It can be many different ways people experience gender-based discrimination. So that's principle one. Principle two really is more inward looking, looking at folks like us who are issuers to make sure that the issuer has the capacity and diversity in their own leadership. I think what's been really interesting is that investing is really not a zero sum game and we are losing a lot by not having more women and more of the LGBTQI plus community making investment decisions. It's made a big difference in what a gender bond even looks like when you don't have women working on them. Principle two, looks at the leadership of these issuer organizations. So for instance, it would look at IAX's own leadership. It would look at also people on the team who are structuring the transactions. Do they have women? Do they have um, also, very importantly, people of color? The intersectionality, again, of having a woman of color working on a deal that's focused on Asia and Africa or Latin America can make a significant difference in how you take investment decisions. And finally, principle three looks at transparency. And I really enjoyed the debate yesterday on ESG. And I think this is really, really timely to think through how would you avoid issues like orange washing. So apart from aligning with, say, what the green and social bonds say, which is to have a, a framework on impact management to disclose this, to have a second party opinion, we're also mandating that you have to verify outcomes with the end beneficiaries. You have to have women who you've collected data from to ask whether the initiative is working or not. So when you do your reporting back against the principles, there have been a set of women who've, whose lives you were meant to transform, who've actually provided data to tell you how that uh, uh, transformation was experienced, if or if not it was experienced at all. We found that as a very powerful way to not only um, have more magnified impact when we do uh, our gender bonds, but also as a very key way to mitigate risk, we actually understand how the proceeds are being used by these women. And if we go to the, the next slide, I'll give you as an example, again, it's very easy to talk about doing all of these things, so very quickly as a case study, IAX has done uh, a number of women's livelihood bonds. Our next bond, which will be issued uh, later in Q4, uh, which we're working very hard on on the side, uh, with, with many of the partners who you see on over here as well, um, it will be a $50 million transaction. It will be a blended finance product. So we are going to, we understand the other side of innovation is risk and there are ways to de-risk the transaction. That's where DFIs play a key role in providing guarantees and subordinated debt pieces. It's a multi-country, multi-continent bond. We're investing both in Asia and Africa. Looking at sectors, so of course microfinance, but clean energy, uh, sustainable agriculture, all these sectors where women play a critical role, not as victims, but as solutions. And finally, I think what's, what's been really important to see is IAX again, we looked inward to align with principle two. We have uh, over 70% of the team uh, working on the bond are women, and over 90% are people of color uh, from the regions that we're investing in, which gives us, we think, a, an edge in understanding both the risk return and the impact, and in particular, the gender lens. And finally, on a last note, just because we're an orange bond doesn't mean we are competing with the other standards that are out there. This is also in line with the ICMA standards. It's also 2x compliant. The orange bond principles have been made to be harmonized with what's out there. So we're complementing what's there, but strengthening particularly the gender lens. Thank you.
Sure, thank you very much, Ms. Gudge, and thank you all for uh, providing some more color on the initiative in general. Now I'm going to move to a panelist discussion where I have some questions I'd like to ask um, the three of you as well. And please, again, do uh, put your questions in the Q&A because we will designate some time uh, momentarily to go through those. But the first question I wanted to ask, uh, the ask panel, and it kind of touches a little bit on what um, you just mentioned, Ms. Gudge, about kind of collaborating or aligning with other principles. And so there are a number of existing standards in the sustainable debt market uh, currently. And um, I guess, how does the Orange Bond Initiative aim to harmonize or, or further complement these? And uh, Mr. Livers, I hope maybe you'd like to open up with, with some remarks on that. Sure. So I think what we're going to, what we're attempting to do is make sure that we are exactly as Natasha said, we're building upon what's already in the in the market at the moment. And and as we saw from that one chart about the showing the growth of the the green social and sustainability bond market, that those principles have been very catalytic in providing growth to the market. I, and so what we're going to try to do with the orange bond principles is focus people more on the gender concept. You know, as I've seen this market continue to evolve, and I see it in our own assets, that we, as I mentioned, we're trying to be more granular. Investors are looking for more granularity. Um, we launched our first actual social bond um, account for a client uh, this, this calendar year, 2022. So there's increasing demand, but we have to make sure that we have the supply that can meet it. So what we're, what we're working at is, is capturing the success that we saw with the Green Bond Principles, but bringing to bear the focus specifically on gender, because what we have seen is that most people, you know, when we talked about this initially, most people would push back, well, you don't really need to do that. That's really a social bond. Well, yes, that is true, but we're not seeing the uptake that I think that you would expect, nor the specificity of outcome that you could receive, because gender investing isn't purely social. There are environmental aspects as well. And as such, we want to make sure that we're able to call out and bring to bear the opportunity set that's across pretty much every impact concept and impact thematic area by specifically funding women and gender in this particular case because of the, the critical role that, that women play in, as I mentioned, society, but also how that translates into their effect on the environment. So hopefully what we're gonna be able to do is, again, as I mentioned, create an environment where issuers are comfortable coming to market because they have a specific framework they can say they're in alignment with and point to that has been independently created that's based off of the tremendously successful green bond principles that are the market standard. Thank you very much, Mr. Liberator. And now maybe I'd, I'd like Mr. Greenberg to come in a little bit on, on what role can DFIs specifically play in, in catalyzing the initiative and, and moving it forward? Yeah, well, we, um Back in 2018, we were one of the original uh, members of a group of DFIs that uh, put together what we call the 2X Challenge at that time, and, and that matured into the 2X Collaborative and ultimately a set of criteria and principles uh, to help people understand what, 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 what that would translate into and with some specificity. And that, and that, and, and that was a, a lengthy process. It wasn't something that just happened overnight because, again, there was a learning curve to go up and sharing the experiences of different organizations um, per and perspectives. But ultimately, a set of uh, specific criteria were agreed that um, we use when we're looking at transactions and to, for ourselves to help determine whether we think it, you know, it qualifies in that regard, but also to, to convey to the market, to signal to, to the market, these are the kinds of things to think about. And when you're coming to us as a DFI, we're going to prioritize transactions that meet these criteria. And it's not a one-size-fits-all. And there are many different ways to, to achieve uh, to aspects of it. It could be, obviously, uh, women employment in, in a transaction. It could be uh, in a project. It could be uh, leadership at, at the uh, management level. Um, it could be products and services that are developed specifically designed for women. And it's really been astounding, I think, in certain ways to, once you, once you have start that dialogue, uh, a lot of companies that were um, that hadn't even thought about it realized that there were a lot of things that they either already were doing that they weren't properly recognizing or that they could do to to advance that that would be consistent with their own business model and their own you know need to achieve the, the financial returns 
and, and also the social return objective that they wanted to achieve. So um, we're, we're uh, so just to finish the thought. Um, again, our role is to provide. Uh, in addition to you know helping build the ecosystem by participating in the steering committee, our main job is to get money out the door, and and whether that's in companies or funds, uh, and and we're very I think now well positioned to do that, and then again provide that capital that's going to de-risk things that uh, otherwise the commercial markets aren't ready to do, um, and uh, and then uh, in turn you know collaborate with the with commercial players um, to. Um, to provide the type of capital that's going to that's going to get them into the transaction, it's it's very we have a very specific and focused mindset in that regard. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Greenberg. And uh, just just I, I know earlier you mentioned about kind of impact washing and greenwashing being quite prevalent in, in across across the green bond industry. But perhaps, Ms. Garchi, you'd like to give some some more color on how the orange bond initiative is actually going to be different to that, and and, and to make sure that it doesn't fall into the same trap. So um, I think women need to be given a value and a voice in these investment decisions. So not just as part of the issuer, not just as having more investors who have these in their teams, but also the actual women on the ground. So I'll, I'll maybe answer this as with an example because I think the other, uh, and I'll tie to another question that I see is getting a lot of upticks on how, how do you involve the global south and intersectionality. But I think when you have a gender bond, so for instance, in our Women's Livelihood Bond series, when we are putting together the portfolio, we actually don't just do a diligence on the company, on their staff, on, on their management, on their leadership, on their operations. We also go and have a number of, 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 of days where we spend asking the women questions. And I think that's been very, very powerful. It shifts the power dynamic back towards the people whose lives were meant to be transforming. It's, it blows my mind that if you've never experienced a certain kind of discrimination that you would be able to solve that problem. And very often a top-down approach where we tell women what they need is what we need to stop doing in gender lens investing. So when, and this also helps us take a very data-driven approach. When we're asking women for information, we can map them better to the SDGs. We can understand how exactly to design loan contracts with impact covenants and gender action plans to push the boundaries of what the women think is most important for them. Instead of us imagining what we think it's, it's, is most important based on papers that we've read in our, in our ivory towers. So I think the verification element will be very powerful. I think having a way to, to map how you uh, align with the principles, maybe sh shades of orange as we have shades of green would be very powerful. And I also think just making sure that, that uh, uh, you're taking this data-driven approach and being very transparent about your reporting. During COVID, we didn't meet every single outcome. Women didn't, for instance, increase income, which is one of the outcomes we were tracking, but they had a lot of other benefits, for, for instance, in the wash sector, the water and sanitation sector, in building better food security, et cetera, which was critical for COVID recovery. So we started shifting measurement towards that. So I think all of these things together will help mitigate the risk of, of orange washing, if you will, uh, as time goes on. Very similar to the question that we have on how do we integrate the global south, when we developed the principles, the 150 organizations who joined our roundtables, we had people from all six continents, predominantly from the global south, uh, who were giving input into this. And I think that's been very critical that we brought those new perspectives in, even though the steering committee, we have people who are leading uh, the space in many ways, but hearing in particular from civil society, from human rights experts, from gender lens uh, experts as well, helped us think through these things in a, in a more robust way. Thank you. Sure, absolutely, and and it's it's great to build on some of the questions we have in the Q and A. But there's just one one more I wanted to touch on. With, with maybe Mr. Liberatory be in a good position to to answer this. But how will the initiative actually help scale the amount of transactions in the gender bond market, but also the size of orange bond uh, transactions? I think that you know, and if it's okay, I was going to just add one thing to what Natasha was just saying. One of the things that occurred during COVID for us as an investor was that while every targeted impact that we thought initially was going to be achieved wasn't, what gave us tremendous comfort was one of the main challenges when you're dealing in any type of microfinance situation is how do we gauge how those lending institutions interact with their client? And are they treating them in a fair manner? Are they just in the way that they're working with them? And it gave us an opportunity to go to IIX and say, well, 
let's talk to the lending institutions to find out what are they proactively doing to help their clients. Are they reaching out? Are they asking if they need anything? And so that's always been a, a real challenge in, in this particular space is ensuring that, the, that, in this case, the women that are receiving the financial, um, the financial outcome are also being treated in a way that helps them get through it when there's challenges or problems. So that was a real positive, I thought. Um, and, and I think that, and then to answer the question you just asked, George, I, I think that it's really important. One of the things in, in asset management is, that's critical is having comfort that there is scalability. And what you need in place is, you know, when we look at smaller types of transactions, there's only a handful of us that are really willing to dig in and look at a $50 million transaction. So what we want to be able to do is create template-like structures that have a framework associated with them that allow investors to be willing to commit the time and energy and effort to evaluate the $50 million transaction because they know the next one is going to be 100 and the one after that is going to be 150 then you're at 200 and you're getting up to index eligible size of 300. And you're able to see a diverse opportunity set where the, uh, you can actually build an entirely, you can build an entire portfolio of these types of securities in a diversified manner where you're not specifically levered to just one issuer, one part of the world, one type of outcome. So I think that if we're able to do this correctly, we're gonna be able to put ourselves in a position where we're gonna be able to rapidly scale the space. And it also proves out that there's actual people in, interested in investing in this way, but also that there's opportunities to invest this way. Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. Libertor. And, and, and just a follow-up question here from the, from the Q&A as well is maybe you can share a little bit more about the, the journey that the steering committee took to actually bring the Orange Bond Initiative to, to the forefront of the markets and what was the process like and um, what, what, uh, how can others interested in creating these initiatives learn from your journey and use that? So perhaps Ms. Garcia, you'd like to first start off and then we can open it to the other two. Yes, just very quickly, um, it was quite the journey. I think we were, it was interesting is we were doing gender lens investing since we started, which was during the 2008 financial crisis. We just didn't know that's what it was called. We just thought that was good business. So it's been a long journey. When we did our first women's livelihood bond, some of the bankers who shall not be named said to just call it a high yield emerging market bond and it will be sold. And we said, no, we'd like to call it a woman's livelihood bond. We want people to know that uh, a woman led firm has designed this and that the proceeds are for women. So it's been a truly interesting journey. But now I think we're, we're at a stage where people have started valuing this. I think a lot of the social movements, whether it's Me Too or Black Lives Matter, have brought things to the attention of, of the wider financial industry that we cannot ignore these sort of social movements and we cannot ignore half of humanity and potentially more than that uh, when we're making these decisions. When we pulled together the steering committee, I think we were therefore very keen to ensure there were people from different countries, from different sectors, people of different co colors at the table uh, designing this. But most importantly, I think, is, is the folks, folks such as yourselves who come and join us in these conversations. Who That's why we have the pledge set up. It doesn't actually mandate you to have a financial commitment. It just allows us to engage you in roundtables, to let you know about transactions that are happening, and to share market intelligence reports when we verify the impact with the women. So uh, again, a warm invitation to everyone here to sign the pledge and, and join us all. Uh, this is not just the steering committee who's leading it. It's all of us. Uh, it takes a village to build a movement like this. But sure. maybe we open it up. Absolutely. <laughs> we have one minute. Sure. Uh, I'm Doug Beal with Boston Consulting Group. And I've worked with a number of the big global banks on their sustainable and social finance framework, so how they make decisions around supporting their clients and labeling and things like this. And there's always a trade-off between getting the label and then the cost of getting that label versus the benefit to their client in lower cost of capital, right? The process you've just described sounds fantastic, but also sounds very high cost. What's the benefit of then labeling something an orange bond? You get different investors, longer term investors, better pricing, that would be my No, point. that's an excellent question. I'll start and then if, if uh, Richard or Stephen you want to jump in. The first thing on the cost is people usually think the impact measurement and the verification with women is going to be a cost. For us, we think that's you investing and in taking smarter investment decisions. You're investing in understanding risks better. You're investing in making sure 
the impact you're promising is better. We're also rolling out digital impact assessment tools that are quite low cost and easily scalable so that you can control the costs of the impact verification with the women. The other costs are very much on par with what you would say in a green and, and, and a social bond. And I think the labeling will allow investors or DFIs who want to play a catalytic role understand that that is in line with certain principles and therefore they may want to come in. So we hope it has that signaling effect as well. But with, with either of you. Yeah, sure. This is a great question that I get all the time. And, and it doesn't cost issuers more to do these securities. That is fallacy. Um, we, we are simply asking is if you are trying to structure a transaction that you believe has a specific outcome, and I'll use green investing because it's really the simplest one to, to, to discuss at the moment. If you're coming to market to tell me that you're gonna build a solar power project, then it's reasonable for me to assume that you can provide to me the megawatt hours of the capacity of that project and the power that it's producing, and if you can't, you're incompetent and I shouldn't invest with you to begin with. So you highlighted a couple of the, the, the benefits is a much wider investor base, a much more stable investor base. One of the things that we have heard back consistently from issuers that have created and structured frameworks, whether it's social, environmental, sustainability, it, and it was actually a surprise to me, was how many have come back and said, you know what, this framework really helped us to better evaluate our own operations and have allowed us to improve our operations in a handful of different ways. And then the last thing that I'll use, and this is not old cynical bond guy you know, talking, is it's amazing to me every issuer who comes to market puts out a press release associated with a green social sustainability bound. That's called marketing. You pay for marketing. So, you know, th th this is a, you know, this is a problem that, you know, we continue to talk about and, and deal with, but try to get issuers to understand again that you're attempting to do something different. You're also trying to establish a business that would help you grow in the future that also allows you to speak positively to your regulators, your employees, your future customers, and also I think hopefully opens up an idea in your head about a wider opportunity set of potential transactions that you may be able to, to create in the future that has a longer run benefit associated with it. Absolutely, thank you very much, Mr. Libertor, and thank you all for your, your questions, and, and, and thank the three of you for uh, telling us a little bit more about the initiative. Uh, we, we have run out of time, we have run over time, but we will be around to take any more questions uh, you have or any more discussions. So thank you all for coming to, to see us, and uh, we hope you've enjoyed learning a bit more about our initiative.